we were talking about headaches and fatigue being an issue for highly sensitive people and, and on this topic of are we more prone to illness or how do we experience symptoms, how do we experience pain, and how do we experience our interactions with the healthcare industry. So I was on my rant and I do have this rant about how when we try to live our lives like the majority, when we assume, you know what assume means, right? You make an ASS out of you and me. When we assume that we can just function like people who are not highly sensitive, who don't have a more reactive brain, then we're more likely to overdo. Now, I am not casting stones here. I'm an overdoer extraordinaire. And it's so frustrating. I really want to be able just to live my life. But listen, this is the hard thing. We weren't born to live a normal life. You're not normal if you're highly sensitive. You just aren't. You have special gifts and they are, you know, people, not everybody loves when I call them superpowers, but they are superpowers. They're just not what we might, what our Western culture might identify as gifts and superpowers because it's, we've gotten so far away in our culture from, you know, honoring the reverent and the spiritual and the inner life and the philosophy. And, you know, you might have found your community where you are really honored and, and respected for your special gifts and also honored and respected for your need to recharge. You know, we give this, we give HSPs this advice for work. If you work, in you know, a relatively normal environment, or even if you're a solo practitioner or a, a solopreneur and you're, you have clients, we have to educate these environments that we perform, we will perform better and more highly than people who don't have this trait, who aren't highly sensitive, if we take care of ourselves, if we are in a good environment. So that makes it really hard and I can be so frustrated and I just want to tell you all please if you would like to see some of my more content on this topic please 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 go into any post recent post on my grid and write health and if you're new to are you highly sensitive write new and I will connect you and give you some information okay somebody is gonna jump on if you're still here so tell me what made you come on? How can I support you? Well, I love your work. Um, and I found out about being an HSP maybe like three or four years ago. And okay, they say they can see me. Yeah. So, um, it's just me. <laughs> like, I've been just, I guess, trying to validate that it's a real thing because. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a trauma response and I do know that like the health issues that I have now, I'm wondering, is it from my diet? Is it from when I used to use substances or, you know, took wrong medication from the doctor? So I'm just trying to still figure it all out. Okay. I, I love that you showed, showed us all your, you know, your true experience there. And here's the kind of difficult answer. Yes, AOTA, my friend, all of the above, because we're so impacted by everything. So what if it is everything or what if it doesn't matter what it is, right? And here you are now mm -hmm. having this experience. I can tell you, and I'm sure since you've discovered it, you've started to see some of the research. It's 100% legitimately rule, real. This research shows brains of highly sensitive people work differently. Now, a lot of HSPs tell me, I'm not sure if I'm actually highly sensitive. Maybe I'm, you know, high functioning autism spectrum. Maybe, you know, maybe that, that language isn't as PC as it should be. Maybe I am a trauma and I have PTSD. I personally also have PTSD. Um, maybe it's just trauma. Maybe it's just substance use in the past. Maybe it's, Look, I don't think it really matters what it is, right? If for some reason your brain is more reactive, you have to take better care of it. Yeah. It's frustrating, isn't it? What's it like for me to say, maybe we don't know the reason and we don't need to know the reason? 
so you don't think we need to know the reason in order to heal <laughs> because like like i was saying in the comments it it's very crippling to live a normal life and yeah it is hard to decide like am i just trying to be like everybody else but there's a part of me that feels like i'm not living up to my full potential you know it's like right. so confusing you know because it's like I don't mind if this is how it's supposed to be, but I almost feel like this is a little past normal, even for a highly sensitive person. Are you, do you mind me asking how old you are? You don't have to tell us yeah. if you don't want. Um, I'm 36. Okay. So what, th this is not just how it's supposed to be, Rachel, by any means. This is not how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be better. And we definitely have to heal from all of our crap from our past trauma, you know, childhood, every, we are so impacted by all of those things. So yes, it matters that they happened, you know, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, um, so many things, everything that happened, even if they wouldn't have been traumatic for people without reactive brains, they could have been traumatic for us. So the trauma can go even deeper. So yeah, we, we do need to heal from those things. But I think what is real for me anyway, is that I have to go out on a limb and be really extreme about protecting my brain. And I'm, I'm not saying anything about you. You can tell us about you in a moment. But for me, I know I don't exercise enough. I don't meditate enough. I don't sleep enough. I don't um, look at the sky enough. You know, that whatever those things are that balance me. I, I recently learned I don't eat enough protein, which helps my nervous system calm, you know? <laughs> and that's, Banjo's like, I'm overwhelmed because somebody's nearby. So, so do you, but the, like, how do you even, how do you even do enough of this when you're trying to like, work and support yourself and be in relationships and live in the world and go to the grocery store you know how how is it even possible to find that amount of time as one of my concerns so are you doing enough what what are you doing um well i definitely know i don't get enough um sunlight for the most mm. because i have a very out of balance circadian rhythm i'm I basically sleep when I when I'm tired which is a lot so I'm just you know sleeping throughout the day which then makes it hard to have a full night's sleep mm -hmm. so then I get sunlight and just struggling financially so sometimes it's hard to leave the house when you know I just feel like I have to be grinding all the time to try and make money and it's just like it feels like a vicious cycle you know so i do know that those things it's hard because i work from home so it's easy to cave in to like going to sleep and being on a whatever schedule yeah do you okay i i don't want you know i'm a psychotherapist but here on instagram i'm not i'm using my psychotherapy lens and knowledge but i'm not practicing psychotherapy here okay that with that said um, sometimes I think when we are sleeping a lot and struggling in some of the ways you're describing, it, it makes me wonder about depression setting in. And untreated depression can become so deeply rooted. I know a lot of HSPs with very deeply rooted depression that they struggle even with treatment to work their way through. So, um, I think it's really important anyone who finds themselves having a hard time being in the world then to really look at and get a diagnosis around depression. The other thing, circadian rhythms are real. And I'm, I'm really into Matthew Walker who wrote Why We Sleep and the Starettes who wrote Built to Move. And um, both of them talk a lot about the importance of creating a structure and a routine around sleep that you stick to and um, to just completely reset everything. But, you know, 
I work a lot with youth, and I'm going to use this as a, as a metaphor or an analogy maybe. Sometimes there are young people, young teens especially, who get completely out of control. And they start acting out in ways, you know, they, they weren't nurtured in the way they needed when they were younger. And maybe they start stealing or sneaking or, you know, doing things that are just their parents have no control over them. And I say to the parents, what, what are you going to do about this? Are you able to regain control and create, you know, structure and rules and, and boundaries in, in your child's life? And if they're not, then that child has to go to residential treatment for a while, frankly, because you can either do it. The parents can do it. So I see I see us as the parents of our own brains. And I always say, like, basically, maybe without the abuse, but we need to create a sort of a military school environment in our lives for our brains and to get really, really strict because you know, Elaine Aaron in the last chapter of The Highly Sensitive Person, and we'll be teaching on this, I'll be teaching a lot on this in April because that's HSP Spirituality Month, says that um, the paying attention to our spiritual life and the inner life is our mission as highly sensitive people. And that's one of the reasons that we suffer because it pushes us to the edge to explore these things. So, you know, do I meditate every single day? I don't even. I, I can preach it, but it's hard because, like you say, you're working to make a buck, and we get into all these systems. Yet, if things get completely out of control, then you're just not functioning anymore, you know? So, can I coach you for a second? Yeah, of course. What's one thing, one kind of radical change that you would be willing to make that, that could help you toward a reset? One thing that you know that you would like to be doing and that you could do. Well, I bought a juicer, <laughs> but I haven't taken it out of the box yet. Um, Cause I heard that juicing is helpful for like your body. Um, okay. And I, so I, nutrition is where you're going with that. What was that? Nutrition. Like improving your nutrition. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Another thing that I know is a huge factor, I believe, is um, I've been dependent on Excedrin migraine for like over 10 years, which mm -hmm. I was not prescribed by any doctor. Like, doesn't say it's not recommended to do that. And I know it's like really hard on my body um, mm -hmm. to be taking that every day especially if it's multiple times a day so i guess the reason i'm really leaning towards the nutrition is because it's like i'm trying to rebuild my immune system so i can get off of these pills because i think like until i get off the pills i'm it's never gonna work out but again it might be more than just the pills but i think the pills play a huge role yeah they have a acetaminophen and caffeine in them right aspirin and, and you know there's migraines are no joke that that pain is so blinding and profound and scary so i can see how you would be able to develop that dependence basically right so i think what kind of a doctor do you work with? Well, I've been going, um, I went to a regular like family physician a few times and they really haven't been able to help me. So I've been trying to like look more into the whole holistic route, you know, mm -hmm. all they really have done for me is try to prescribe me more pills to get me yeah. off of it. And it can work temporarily, but the minute that some something triggers a headache, I really think a lot of it came from, like like you said before, stress. I don't think I've ever really had debilitating migraines, but I found that it worked to get rid of headaches. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's like I basically found that nothing else really gets rid of a headache like Excedrin migraine. and. I just and when you find a fix like that, it's like yes, right? 
you know? Yeah, because then I can function, but then it starts causing headaches when I don't take it now. Rebound. Right. So Absolutely. I kind of and feel helpless. Like, I don't know who to turn to or what to do, you know? Okay, so, Rachel, I think you do need medical support to get off of it, you know? And I it's sort of outside the scope of my license and my practice, but I've had really, I will just say from my own personal perspective, I've had really great success with Japanese style acupuncture. There, um, it's a, a gentler kind of acupuncture than Chinese style acupuncture. And um, they use finer needles and seem to be, at least my acupuncturist is very tuned in to sensitivity. He's so sensitive himself because you have to be sensitive to even diagnose. So um, I, I would I don't think anyone should abruptly stop or start any kind of medication without some medical supervision and advice. And, um, and I just wonder if you were able to shift how you take care of your brain just in your own mind what if you just shifted to think about because yeah it's your brain who's crying out when you have a headache right your brain's saying ah too much whatever it is I don't know what it is and you know yes dietary things cause headaches and yes as a sensitive person you're going to be more impacted by the headache but what I would, what I think is, if you gave your brain more care, like don't think about getting off of the the Excedrin right now. Get get a medical, get medical, even if it's non traditional medicine, but get some medical practitioner to support you, giving you other measures that can support you as you do this. But in the background, you sort of need to go in training, like an Olympic athlete. Hey, it's Olympic season, right? So. How can you start to train your brain to let it, to really convince it that you're going to take better care of it? So can I give you three things? Yeah. Okay. You have a pen or you're young enough. You probably type on your phone. Um, <laughs> so one I would say is to really increase how much you close your eyes during whenever you're awake to close your, to create some kind of habit to close your eyes for 30 seconds, three times an hour. There's this 20, 20, 20 rule. And um, this, let me see if I can remember it. It's every 20 minutes, close your eyes for 20 seconds and then look 20 feet away, you know, away from your screen or away from your papers or whatever it is you're working on. So to create some kind of rule like that or set a timer on your phone or an alert or every time you take a drink, every time you, you pick up your water and take a sip to close your eyes for 20 to 30 seconds. 10 is even great. If you drive a car, every time you get in the car, sit for a moment and close your eyes, even just to count to 10. Because 80% of stimulation comes in through the eyes. They truly are the windows to the soul. So when you close them, you, you create... A barrier between your brain and the outside world and it gives it just a little TLC okay so that's one close eyes can you do that yeah and it's really interesting that you say that because I was trying to get a really big project done yesterday and I was having a hard time pushing through but I noticed when I would like stop to stretch and close my eyes like I needed to do it it. even though I didn't want to mess my makeup up I'm like oh my gosh I need to close my eyes it feels so good and it's just really like amazing that yeah. you said that you know yeah I mean it, it, it is amazing the the impact it's such a small thing and remember that I don't remember the stats on this but I think it's like five you're five times more likely to achieve a goal if you write it down so that's why I'm having you write these things down so everybody else who's hearing this or listening, it's a great goal for all of us. It's just, you know, what I would say is what's good for highly sensitive people is good for all people. Mm -hmm. And HSPs are as unique and diverse as everybody else. So even if it's just good for Rachel and me, it's also good for you. So um, everybody write this down and commit yourself to doing it. Just try it for one week and see what happens. Okay. The second thing is I'm wondering about 
movement? Like, could you walk in nature every day for five minutes? Yes. <laughs> Everybody hear her hesitation? She's arguing with herself. <laughs> I know. I, the reason I hesitate is because I know how good it is for me, but yet I still, like, some days, for whatever reason, don't leave the house. And no, I know. Me either. You're just exhausted. And life's too much. Yeah. Okay, so here's, here's one of my favorite interventions. Write this sentence down, everybody. The reason I don't walk outside every day is because. The reason I don't walk outside every day is because. And then put the answer down. Okay, I'll say it one more time for everybody. We'll put it in the, in the comments below when we repost this. The reason I don't walk outside every day is because. Can you read us your sentence when you have it, Rachel? You can be our guinea pig. Um, well, I know I have two reasons. <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter. You can put them both or just put one, but just read the sentence the way I said it. The reason I don't walk outside every day is because I get stuck in the house and can't move. I, whatever. Choose one and write it down and then read it to us. Thank you. Somebody put, the reason I don't walk outside every day is because I am dizzy with anxiety, so I am scared. You have one for us, Rachel? You didn't well, know. it's not. You didn't know I was going to make you work, did you? <laughs> it's not, not like a one word thing, but basically the reason I don't walk outside every day is because I live in an apartment and I don't feel like I have a safe space where I can just like stretch and lay in the sun and not have people like looking at me. Okay, okay stop. That's perfect. It'd be great if you had those written down. Mm -hmm. So write them down real quick just do a little shorthand and the person who said the reason i don't walk outside every day is because i'm dizzy and scared right be sure you have that written down as a sentence the reason i don't walk outside every day everyone some new people joined write this down the reason i don't walk outside every day is because maybe you do you can put something else in there okay rachel do you have it down at least in shorthand yeah okay now, I want you to look at your sentence, everybody, and cross out the word don't. Draw a line through it. Now, reread the sentence. The reason, I'll use this person who shared in the comments. The reason I walk outside in nature every day is because I am dizzy and scared. See how that works? Mm. The reason I walk out outside every day is because I am dizzy, anxious, and scared. Can you read yours, Rachel? The reason I walk outside every day is because I live in an apartment and I don't have my own space. And yeah, I guess that's how I would say it. You can start stop there, right? That's enough. Do you see how that makes sense? The reason I walk outside every day is because I live in an apartment and I don't have my own space. So you walk outside to go create it and find it. Right. And it turns out that if you just walk around the block and you live in like a gross, dirty city, that's just me, I'm a farm girl, sorry for city people. I know you love the city people, you city people. The reason, if you just go walk out around the block, it changes everything. So. I just invite everyone to take that tool right now. The reason I don't blank is because blank. Anything that your brain is struggling with, because remember, for those of you who, who came in later, we are being the parents of our own brains. Because these brains, they're very, very highly tuned and reactive. They're so clever. And we have to work really hard to be good you know, parents of our brains so they don't take us down the wrong path. Okay. so. That was tool number two. Tool number three, first one was close eyes at least three times an hour for at least 20 seconds, preferably 30. 
The second one is to walk outside in nature for five minutes every day. You know, we do the best we can. I could say I want you to walk outside in nature for 50 minutes and I want you to walk a minimum of 12,000 steps every day. And I do. But five minutes is a big step in the right direction because once you start going, it feels pretty good. Usually we do more. Okay. Number three is, I think it's get your heart rate up. It's a very good headache treatment to get your heart rate up. So, and you know, look, we all, almost every HSP I know suffers from anxiety at one time or another. And people call me all the time and say, I meditate, I exercise, I sleep, I eat right, I do everything right. Why do I still have anxiety? But when I start to really talk to them about it and I find out what they're really doing, they're not really doing enough because it blows your mind how much you have to do to take care of this brain. And I'm sorry, I said this earlier, I'm ticked that I have to work so hard to take care of my brain. I just want to go live my life and be a normal person. And I bet most of you do too. It's just not the brain you have. And that's, and you know, maybe we have to grieve that loss. I mean, like you're brilliant at whatever you do that you have a calling at HSPs. And I know you are too, Rachel. You're brilliant at what you do when you, when you want to do it and you're doing it well. And your brain can't keep that up if you don't take care of it. So do you have a favorite way to get your heart rate up? Like to engage yes. your muscles and what is it? Dancing. Oh, dancing. I love that. I would have never thought of that. I, even though I've been told that before and it does a lot for me. It wasn't on the top of my mind. Thank you so much. Anyone else who's here, if you can share with us your favorite way to get your heart rate up. And is there a certain style, like do you turn on music? A certain kind of music? Yeah. Hip hop um, okay. does for me for sure. But obviously, can you give I us love a all song um let's see here i mean we're all looking for ideas <laughs> so. um that's such a loaded question right <laughs> okay no pressure no pressure i'll give you mine okay um not hip-hop my parents were born in 1940 and they loved Elvis and 50s music. And so as a child, like we didn't listen to what was contemporary when I was a kid, we listened to 50s music. And my parents were great dancers. They did swing dancing and they taught us all to twist. Mm -hmm. So like I can really get going to 50s music that's really kind of bebop, which is, you know, taken from other, um, from soul basically, you know, and, and the roots of hip hop. So I really can get going to say, you know, just, I'll just say the twist, the song, the twist, I think that's chubby checkers. Mm -hmm. And, um, and if I could, you know, you, you take a dish towel and you, you, you dry your fanny with it and twist mm -hmm. does it for me. Yeah. I just want I just wanted to ask you for a song because I'm going to give you the homework. Your assignment will be to to choose that song and to play it every single day at the same time or close to the same time like before you eat lunch or whatever meal you reliably eat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just to put it on and really jam. The twist is not you can do more. You're 36. You can you can really get moving. Um some of my other things are like, I'm a real big fan of planks and push ups and um, bouncing, jumping up and down a hundred times is a really good one. And the last one I really love is the nitric oxide dump, which you can look up Zach Bush, nitric oxide dump. Lots of people are doing it, um, but he's the one who kind of popularized it. So getting your heart rate up, why is that so important? Because it burns off those anxiety chemicals that are trapped inside. And that is, those are contributing to your headaches. It also, okay, so the reason I don't get my heart rate up every day is because I, I have headaches and I have fatigue. So do you see how that, that works? If we cross out the don't, the reason I get my heart rate up every day is because I have headaches and fatigue. 100% it helps. Right. Yeah, and I just, it, it baffles me because I know these things and it's like, I don't know how it doesn't happen every day. You know what I mean? I'm like, where did no. the time go? I like do know. I do know 100%. It's like, it's almost like a drug or a fog. And I believe it's the overwhelm fog, but for some of us, it's the depression fog. So, 
um, it, it is, it's like swimming against the tide. It's hard work. Yeah. And I guess I do, there's certain things that I'm kind of like, I won't budge on them as priorities. Like brushing my teeth right when I wake up is like a month. It's like I can't waver on that, but then like trying to wash my face twice a day, I don't know if I'm trying to like over exert myself by making that, which it doesn't always happen, but like that takes up okay. quite, quite a bit of energy and time. Okay, I'm gonna give you just a little psychological intervention here. <laughs> if, if you're committed to brushing your teeth every morning, I am too. Like every once in a while I miss, but it's just when I'm rushing around, you know, kind of maniacally because I've over overbooked and over stimulated myself. But for the most part, I would bet the vast majority of people are committed to brushing their teeth in the morning. So do at least one of these three things, if not two of them, when you brush your teeth. That's it's called habit, habit bunching. And if you really like write it down, make it big on your mirror, like tape it to your toothbrush. Then, you know, then every time you brush your teeth, you close your eyes while you're brushing your teeth. Yeah. And maybe you put the song on. Like if you use a Sonicare, you could at least dance for two minutes while you're, while you're Sonicare, you know, you're brushing your teeth through Sonicare. The times, for those of you who don't know what that is, the toothbrush that stays on for two minutes, so it keeps you brushing your teeth long enough. So, um, yeah, so somebody says here, connect the habits new to old, right? So you put your new habits, habit bunching is put your new habits with your old ones. And toothbrushing is a great one. That's why I also said for people who drive a car, for example, every time you touch a car door or a steering wheel or open and close a car door, if you close your eyes for 10 to 30 seconds, that's another habit bunching technique. Yeah. So. Rachel, just in closing, I want to say the struggle is real. It is yeah. real. It's not that you're particularly ill or particularly a freak. Not at all. This, it, it's hard. But here's the difference. If you weren't sensitive, you know what you could do? You could just live your life abusing your body and your brain, and it wouldn't even make a difference. I'm just rolling my, my eyes because it's so frustrating. But you're not. And that, that's the reality. We can't just live like that. We have to do the maintenance. And it takes a lot, a lot of extra time and energy. Do you know research in 2019 showed that our brains keep working even after we go to sleep, even after we stop thinking? They keep working. So we have to stay in bed a lot longer in order to get adequate rest. Oh, my God. I'm rolling my eyes again. That pisses me off. Right. So. You know, the, the reality is your brain's more sensitive. That's the bad news. You can't just function. You can't just pretend like you can do what everybody else can do. The good news, every little thing you do impacts you way more. Like these interventions for somebody who's not highly sensitive, they would be good for them, but they're not going to make a market difference in their life at all. But if you could really do these three things, just try it for one week. Some work better for some people, you know, find your own. But if you really do it, it will have a huge impact on, these are tiny things we talked about, right? They'll have a huge impact on you because your sensitive brain, the same one that gets overwhelmed or fogged in so you can't remember to do to take care of yourself. I really know what you're talking about, trust me. <laughs> that same brain will be more profoundly impacted. That same reactivity is even more reactive to the positive things than it is to the negative things. So it's worth it. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you have any tips, like, how people around me can support me? Because, like, I know I'm going to be going on vacation with my family this summer, and I don't think that they understand it. And I've tried to, like, tell them that I am and send them videos, and they don't really seem like they care too much. And I know it's, like, my responsibility, but I guess I'm trying to figure out how I can still go on vacation with them, but take care of yeah. myself. Okay. So the thing I would say about that is, first of all, definitely sit down with them and watch my talk at Google or the sensitive documentary. My talk at Google is only like the, the content's only about 25 minutes long. And then there's about 20 minutes plus or minus a couple of questions. And the questions come from Google and YouTube employees. So they're just, 
you know, questions from real people about real things. And um, I, I find that people are really receptive to that. The documentary is about, is it an hour and 15 minutes long, I think, um, sensitive to the untold story. And in there, you know, Elaine Aaron wrote it. And um, in that documentary, they are talking to lots of scientists and physicians and, you know, people who have good credibility. Alanis Morissette. So I don't know. Somehow or other, she's become developed credibility around psychological stuff. But at least she's famous, right? So, um, so that those two um, resources are really helpful for creating. But it helps if you sit down and watch it with them, so you know they're actually watching it, and make yourself vulnerable to answer questions. The other thing is, I find it best for highly sensitive people to write out what they want to say. And it could be an unsent letter, or it could be a sent letter. But to, to start ahead of time, to right now think about what kinds of things will make vacation work for you. I Family vacations have been, by, 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 what's that expression? For the most part, family vacations have been really challenging and unpleasant for me with my family of origin. Um, we're just so different. You know, one of the things that is true for me is like, and, and I think, say you go on a cruise or you go to one of those resorts, the way most people manage that and enjoy that is by being drunk the whole time because alcohol is usually free. And like, I can't drink like that. I'm not clean and sober necessarily, but I, I can only drink very little earlier in the day and rarely. <laughs> I don't get to spend my vacation drunk. So, you know, that's, so you need people. And sometimes when I go on these vacations, there's only like two people who aren't partying the whole time. So that's a different kind of interaction. So that would be an example. I need more time alone. I will have to rest more. I might not go on every outing. You know, so you start to brainstorm that list of what you need to help your nervous system do well. And, um, and then, yes, we have to communicate it. We have to tell them. So write it out. And whoever your advocate is, I have um, one sister who is not highly sensitive, who is one of the partiers. She's like, her social intelligence is, you know, so high it's off the charts. And I'm an introvert. <laughs> so, um, but the funny thing is, I can tell her the ways that I feel like a freak and the ways that I need it to be different. And she can just take it in. She doesn't care, but then she knows. And I have an aunt like that too. She's only a few years older than me. So she's really more like a cousin or a sister. And um, these two people in my life can give me such great advice for how to communicate to the rest of the family. So find that advocate. And then I've got my mom who's like, just like me. And I tell her, but, you know, she sort of suffers with it. She can listen and hear, but she doesn't feel like she can necessarily help me. And she, she's probably thinking, I, I haven't really had this conversation with her, but she's probably thinking, you know, yeah, that sucks. And I wish that wasn't me too. <laughs> Not in that language because she's a very proper Southern woman. But, um, you know, it's, it, the reality is that we need a, a, an ally. So, in it, and I was giving the example of, of my sister and my aunt because it doesn't have to be someone like you, but to find an ally that you can tell your story to. And then I'll tell you, my Auntie Phyllis, she's amazing. She tells me exactly how to tell the rest of the family what language to use. It's amazing. So, find your resources and your allies. And if there's no one in your family that can help you in this way, Find somebody outside your family and read them your lists, and they'll tell you where you're sounding a little bit judgmental or harsh or victimy, and help you rewrite it in a way that just makes sense. Like it's not, it's not weird. Like people are different. Everybody's different. Everybody has different needs. And when you're feeling tired and put upon, it's hard to and stressed and overwhelmed. It's really hard to advocate for yourself. So that's why I say, do it before the vacation. Is that yeah. Helpful. Yeah. And I did actually notice I was trying to do that on the last vacation, like sit out from every gathering. <laughs> and I think it's good that I just communicate that so that no one gets like surprised or feels or wastes money or whatever, you know, and the yeah. other 
is like my heart wants to do everything and then like when it comes down to it sometimes it's like my body just will not allow it and then right point people including myself you know and yeah that one one's a really hard one because it's like i don't want to overextend myself um but, but i I don't want to miss out on things like I love doing all these things. But yeah, I just sometimes in the moment I'll be like, like, yes. But then when it comes down to it, it's like my body is just too tired. Okay. Okay. I have a couple things I want to say about that. I, the disappointment is real. It's so disappointing. Sometimes I think if we take better care of ourselves in the lead up during the day when we're not at activities, then we might be able to go to the activity, but just not for the whole time, or maybe even just for 15 or 20 minutes just to go say hi to everybody. Recently, there was a big gathering with all my nieces and nephews and my parents and my sisters and their partners and big gathering. And um, the kids started showing up early because they were gonna help me set up. It was a graduation party for my son. And so, you know, what I did, I, um, I bought all the young people a drink. They're all over 21 except one. And so I bought everyone a drink. And um, so like I was the life of the party because I bought all these young adults um, a, a drink at the restaurant. And, um, and then like, I didn't really engage the rest of the time, but I made a big, like a big splash, a big, like Auntie Laney is fun splash. And, um, and then I withdrew. So, and it doesn't have to be about the money. It just happens to be that was one thing that I could do at this point in my life. And um, there's some family history that my, my dad doesn't like people to pay for drinks at restaurants because it's a ripoff, you know. So I was like kind of being rebellious toward our parent, my parents who are 83. And um, so anyway, what about just taking really good care of yourself, going for a short time? Now, sometimes on vacation, that means you need your own car. So a way to prepare if you're local at some with where some family members live to ask if there's a car you can borrow to drive and this is true for hsps everywhere across the land have your own mode of transportation and that's one of the things i love about rideshare because you know even though it costs money you can always get a ride home and um to just warn people ahead of time and plan to when if you do go don't go for the whole thing and respect your brain that way is that yeah helpful yeah it is it's hard because it's um i when i'm out that's when i actually do have energy and i can usually like i'll i'll push myself like i'll go for hours and hours because i'm just so excited to like i actually made it out and i'm yeah people. um so yeah so it's that part, but it's the actually getting there part is the hardest part. Like right. leaving the house, getting to the event, that is the most hardest part. And and I guess having boundaries too, because I know I go too hard and push myself really hard when I am out. Rachel, this is back to parenting your brain. Like you you must be the parent of your own brain. And I remember many years ago, my therapist um called me on this. This was before I met Elaine Aaron and even knew I was highly sensitive. I and mean, of course I knew I was highly sensitive, but before I knew anything about it. And she made me put in my calendar, I was already using Google Calendar. She made me write down like transportation time, you know, driving to the acupuncturist or the chiropractor or driving to work, driving home, like to literally calendar everything. And so that I couldn't be in denial and to make promises to myself that I would only stay this amount of time or that, you know, if you blow your wad, I call that blowing your wad when you go and you, you just go all out and you have a great time, the next day you're zilch. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It just means you need recovery. So you have to schedule it. So it's really hard to live by this, the fly by the seat of our pants when we're highly sensitive. And yeah. sometimes you can do it, but you're gonna pay the price. Like I always know if I travel too much, I'm going to be just, <laughs> you know, just knocked out for days afterwards. Yeah. So that, that client I mean, talking about re resonated so much with me where you, that you said they need to do something like every other day, like, like yeah. rest day is every other day, basically. <laughs> I'm going to try that now that you've reminded me of that or, you know, your, your thing made me think of that. I'm going to try it because 
it's so I really don't like living in denial that I can just keep go 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 okay I'm gonna say one more thing and then I have to I have to go 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 <laughs> um, this last thing I want to say is that the bottom line around all of this is self-compassion it's about being kind and loving and tender towards yourself toward the vulnerable places in yourself and I think because we're so different and we feel in the cultures that we live in you know pretty much most people using Instagram live in these cultures because of them we can be really in a complex of feeling like there's something wrong with us and I don't know about you but I can easily go to being mad at myself or disappointed in myself or frustrated with myself and you know what that's not a path to success no I need to be so compassionate toward myself so loving toward myself because you know my brain and my body I'm working them really hard and maybe I'm not always taking care of them but that's not because there's something wrong with me it's because I it need I need more care than the average bear and so do you <laughs> yeah thank you so much I'm so glad thank you I did. Rachel I'm so glad you did too because you know what you're helping so many people right now so thank you for being transparent and vulnerable and sharing your true self and your heart with us I really appreciate you and thank you for all that you do I always watch your videos and lives I love them oh thank you thank you all right I hope to see you around the around the waves very soon all right bye take care